Hey, top of the morning to y'all. So, um, yeah, after a fucking just hellacious day yesterday, I finished my exam, confident in how I'll do in that, and um, yeah, despite all my quips with um, the whole university experience and just the lack of action on people who are supposed to be doing their jobs um you know all that disheartening stuff i'm gonna i'm gonna pass without a doubt i got an a on my paper 30 percent of my grade so if i if i get even above a passing mark on my exam which i know i'm gonna get way beyond um because I'm, I'm pretty damn confident in my answers um yeah no i got this from the bag um uh, now I just need, I need a fucking job. I need a job. I need a fucking real job. Because, <clears throat> frankly, I think I'm just wasting my time with the university. Um, maybe it's just the one university I've gone to that's been, like, a major fucking letdown. But, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, doesn't really inspire me to spend money to go back. Um, and... If I was to go back, it'd be for something that, you know, could potentially yield a career. And, you know, it's uh, having electives like philosophy and psychology may look nice and um, help you into another career, but it's not exactly a career maker itself. But I wanted to do something a little different today. Um, I'm going to play some chill music, and I am going to read to you a novel idea that I mapped out and um, the method that I've been using for mapping out novels over the last little while. Um, well, I mean, last last year at least. Um, I used to do the whole, like, uh, you've probably seen this as kind of a cliche in detective shows and whatnot, where I have the cork board and then they'll kind of make these spider webs linking one target to another, to another, to another. You see it in movies all the time. I used to do it like that. Um, but now I, I, I will type up a template giving, in brevity, the main beats of the narrative from start to end. And so this is one um, that I did the template for. I never started on the novel itself, as I have a tendency, because despite mapping out like over a dozen novels, I have a tendency to start them and then get an idea for another one and just set my sights on that instead. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I got a join of uh, my slam and sledge just without uh, without tobacco because I do have cigarettes here because yesterday was insanely fucking stressful. So I caved because, you know, I'm human and I'm fallible like everyone else. I'm not afraid to admit, but this is, yeah, a fuckload of hash, some sativa and some CBD isolate. So I'm going to get really fucking stoned. Uh -huh. I'm going to read you this template. This is called Angels vs. Aliens. Sounds silly, but um, I think you will grow to appreciate it. I hope, I mean, I was, I was proud of it anyways. It's, the template itself is about 2,000 words, um, which is about average. I try to do about at least 2,500 words most of the time. This is actually a little bit shorter. But um, yeah, here we go. So, in an alternate world, disclosure of alien species with malevolent intentions leads to mass disorder and ultimately the topping, toppling of many major world powers. Amidst, amidst the chaos, people around the world have fleeting encounters that change their worldview with angels bound to mortal form, typically appearing as pale, light-haired people with bright green eyes that gleam and catch the sur surrounding ambient light. Um, and they also have night vision in the dark, so their eyes glow all creepily. Um, you know, like you may some cats in an alley in the dark, and their eyes glow, or a raccoon. And I don't know about you, but I find that fucking creepy as fuck. Um, which is, you know, probably a result of my, you know, evolutionary intuition going 
well, this could be a predator. This could be a predator. Look out, look out. But anyway, um, so yeah. These encounters with these anthropomorphic, pale skinned, light haired, bright green eyes, night vision bearing angels. Um, <clears throat> and I know that sounds very like Aryan in description. Um, like kind of like the whole nordic aliens thing but it's like no no they're like like deathly pale deathly pale and by light hair i mean like they're like bright uh like like white hair um but anyways it is common for them to dress as vagabonds or an otherwise shabby attire <sighs> they possess a hypnotic quality that allows them to control some people who fall into a a fugue state if they are shown the glory of God, yet with others they become trapped in a dark night of the soul. Because I'm sure many of you with depression or who have had spiritual enlightenment where, you know, like for me my spiritual enlightenment was just seeing the yellows of society and being like, oh fuck, I'm only one person, what the hell am I going to do about this? Where do I start? You know, and that, that feeling of being cornered by chaos and you know, being aware but not knowing what actions to take, that's kind of, you know, the whole idea of the Dark Knight of the Soul. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, the, the people who get that effect, they become depressed, lethargic, disenchanted, full of self-deprecation, and struggle to find meaning in life. The angels appear to some and transmit warnings to others via the unleashing. <coughs> of their true form, like in the Bible, they're crazy looking. They look like fucking DMT entities or um, you know, high dose mushroom entities. Like, uh, you know, that's why they, like in Midnight Mass, as the priest states, they always go, do not fear. I mean, I'm pretty sure these accounts in the Bible are just either schizophrenics or uh, people who, you know, like, like the, Kabbalistic um, uh, Jews would go out in the desert until they were like, you know, so severely sunstroke they are hallucinating themselves into the kingdom of heaven or whatever, you know. Um, but uh, back then, you know, it, mental illness wasn't a recognized thing. Um, you know, psychotropic drugs wasn't a recognized thing. Alcohol was thought to cure your thirst back then. Um, but uh, yeah, anyways. Um, so yeah, you know, when they unleash their true form, um, something so immensely powerful, they're crippled by the fact they are not fully within the reach of God's chair. Um, cause, and, um, so Ezekiel, I believe, um, he describes how, uh, you know, he go, he ascends up to heaven and he sees God's throne and the angels are going around it going, holy, 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 holy. So, you know, this is like, uh, like uh, for the purpose of the story, um, as I say here, um, God's chair is something that's basically a giant interstellar battery that charges angels with this fury that suddenly when they show their true form. As on Earth, staying in their true form would A, maim, madden onlookers, and potentially even obliterate entire regions um, you know, they don't have the discipline of that heavenly being anymore for some reason or another, so they can't control the amount of output that is unleashed when their true form emerges. Um, yeah, um, and being so distant from God, they can't, uh, like recharge themselves so essentially the if they burst into their true form they'll essentially start self-cannibalizing their own power and once they reach a critical mass an explosion that would give every blast set off during the cold war a run for their money happens but by taking a certain something they can sustain a near human form for a time yet are still basically powder kegs as they are sitting on a lot of energy while in human form and yes, an angel self-combusting and, and obliterating a ton of the universe is definitely going to be factored into the story later. Not so subtle, 
foreshadowing, but again, this is a template. The events are brought about when an alien species uh, that has been covertly seizing, uh, mutilating, and impregnating people on, on Earth under the cloak of dark is revealed by an impending leak. No, not a government leak. Why, the government, they don't, they don't make leaks. Government workers who go rogue. Like Snowden might, but uh, you know they're working. You know, it's hypothetically we have agencies, human beings. They're doing that under their own volition, and certainly not under orders from the government, because the government doesn't want that information to get out. Um, but yeah, so uh, a leak occurs. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, you think the government would reveal that? Well, what they would do is be incompetent and place their files on an easily decrypted server that is hacked by an autistic pothead who is subsequently found dead by suicide, as of course the government had nothing to do with it. Um, and that little bit is inspired by a few people. Like, I can't remember the name of the dude. But, um, in the 90s, there was this autistic pothead in, I believe, Scotland, who, um, he hacked into NASA, uh, very, very easily hacked into NASA's website, and he, like, released a bunch of classified files, and he even claimed that they were hiding alien moon bases and stuff like that. That is, that remains to be seen, but either way, he did enough got enough information, got deep enough into the government's files to, uh, for the U.S. to order an extradition, and he was tried, and, um, I believe he was, uh, prosecuted, um, but, uh, yeah, no, so anyways, it's inspired by that, and then also, you know, the government, you know, having critics like Gary Webb or Danny Casolaro, who go, you know what? Things are getting really shady because of the information I'm releasing. If I end up dead in the next few days, I didn't do it to myself. Boom. Like, with Gary Webb. Oh, yeah, yeah, total suicide. Fucking gun. He took the gun, put it to the back of his head, and pulled the trigger. Yep. Nothing suspicious there. But, uh, yeah, so those are the two people who kind of, uh, inspired that part. But, yes, so, um... Uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh, basically the information about these aliens, uh, who, you know, just kind of made a deal with the government, released by an autistic pothead, and then he turns up dead, of course, a couple days later. Um, so, in any case, uh, the files hit the press, this crowd goes wild, pandemonium, as far as the eye can see, economic collapse, and Ouroboric political devouring of each side takes place, so, in essence, liberals, republicans, conservatives, democrats, whatever you want to call them. you know, the two, uh, majority political views just fucking, yeah, as I said, robbers just fucking devour each other, they just, you know, go fuck it, we've been, you know, on the brink of a civil war for a long time, let's just fucking do it, so, as I said, pandemonium sweeps across the world. Fuck, I am fucking big, man. This stuff is so strong. Yeah, so, um, you know, the churches wage war against one another because, again, as I'm saying, this is like an excuse for all the shit that, uh, you know, various you know, ideological groups have wanted to do for a long time but can't get away with because of, well, the law and the fact that they could be criminally penalized for it uh, or ousted on the internet. They don't care anymore because everyone's focusing on the fact that there's aliens fucking doing malicious shit. Um, so yeah, uh, churches wage war with one another and the rest of the world who's been waiting with bated breath and excuse to kill a fuckload of people sees the opportunity to purge themselves of unwanted citizens or political prisoners Riot, riots rampage through every street with heavily constructed equipment at their disposal after various labor unions merged into a mass gang after vocational nosedives 
because, you know, everyone would lose their job at this point, fucking. And, uh, so, yeah, the union workers are just like, you know, fuck it, we're gonna, we're gonna just become gangs. And just, like, you look at the formation of most gangs, like, you know, blood scripts, you know, it all started out of desperate circumstances, you know, a tribal means of wanting to protect, um, you know, a, a, a community that is very, very much in the minority. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I've met dock workers, and they are fucking, they're pretty, they're pretty surely fucking tough people, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fuck with them, you know, those, those union guys, like, but, uh, yeah, so, um, it's just, yeah, tribalism becomes the default mode of action as expected communities form based mostly, or, sorry, as unexpected communities form based mostly on association to be a spiritual like-minded so like new age people <clears throat> for example uh coalesce and sort of form a like new age gang um well the first time it's happened um uh, uh people are pushed together by circumstance some people um because of this become inextricably linked and constantly at the throats or at the throats of any opposing groups. So essentially there's a bunch of people and these are gonna be the main characters in the story. I don't outline who the characters are, but um, the main characters are they and this is this is a recurring uh, theme in my or plot device, whatever you want to call it in my story. But people are drawn together by like an intuitive sense of I need to go there and do this, that. Yeah, you know, kind of like the stand, right? It's not that, that's not, that's not plagiarism. That's, that was, the stand was not the first story to do that, and it certainly wasn't the last. Um, but I, the reason it's a reoccurring game for me is not because I'm just being lazy, it's because I see it as a metaphor for people who just do things in life without being able to explain it. They just do it without thinking. And then if you ask them, why are you doing that? They wouldn't be able to give you a sufficient explanation. So it's, it's sort of, you know, it's, actually, you know, I, I, I'm going to hold off on explaining an allegory because I want to be like David Lynch and just like, oh, sorry, I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to say I'm a, anywhere near as talented as David Lynch, but I, just with his approach to interpretation of his, like, highly, highly allegorical, but, um, like, nonsensical on a surface level movies, and in, uh, in the most brilliant ways, I've written tons of long essays interpreting this movie, um, like, he refuses to give anyone explanations because he likes the fact that people are coming up with their own interpretation. And I think that's a great way of doing it. Um, you know, the m mystery is what makes a lot of these things work. It's what makes cosmic horror work, if it's done right. Um, but I shall proceed. So, yeah. Um, it is implied that the driving reason behind um, such unre unrelenting outrage and the public is an absence and maybe even death of God. And that brings to mind, I was, another uh, title I came up with for this was God's Ego Death. Um, so please let me know what you think is better, angels versus aliens or God's Ego Death. The first one is more kind of like, I think, has more appeal to like a public audience. Oh, angels versus aliens, that must be crazy. But then I also get the sense that people might think of that fucking, like, stupidly forgettable movie, uh, uh, Cowboys vs. Aliens or whatever. So I don't want it to, I don't want this to come off as schlocky, because I actually have packed a lot into the story. Um, as, as you'll see, we are just, I'm, like, I've literally just started here. Um, and I'm, I, I'm also providing you context, because the template is a template for me. It's not necessarily a template for you. I want to explain to you um what kind of the viscera is um in this you know, so to speak uh but anyways um so uh yeah, yeah 
there so yeah it's it's implied uh, uh and one angel even says that god told them he went on a pilgrimage to meet their maker so god went to try to find the god that created them uh and hasn't been seen since that's what one angel is saying it's also implied that angels know God's demise or potential departure and are merely manipulating humans for the purpose of self-preservation. Then, and this is where the antagonist really comes in, and the antagonists aren't just the aliens, it's something more than that. Um, so we the, enter the 21st century fallen angel. Um, that's right. All the fury of being a scorned servant of the Lord for eternities after God vanishes one dutiful angel takes it personally and vows to destroy the world his master created manifesting as a huge smoldering storm like what I kind of visualized for this was a big red cloud of thunder and sort of um, like you know those those depictions of, um, I can't remember what type of angels they are, but in the Bible and the Ezekiel thing, like spinning wheels with eyes on them. It's kind of like that, but you're using cogs in it too, and so it's just moving around, and it's like fucking chewing up anyone or anything that's like caught within it. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, da, da, da. Yeah, there's a description, um, so, uh, at the, at the storm's eye, um, a hungry jagged wheel with gears and cogs bloody and rusted spin around with such speed and veracity that they suck in all surrounding terrain and all the organic matter that their reach is blended into a pulp, or within their reach, and it's blended into a pulp by the teeth of these spinning gyroscopic appendages of a cosmic being hellbent on retribution and hungry beyond mortal comprehension. Hungry for what? Hungry for, you know, the remaining, you know, vestiges of God within people because, you know, we are created in God's image, says the Bible, right? Now, this story may sound very religious from an anti-religious person, but that doesn't mean I'm not familiar with religion. I'm not willing to make fiction that deals with religion. I, you know, I think uh, biblical imagery is some of the most uh, recognized in especially the Western public eye, uh, because it's just, you know, it's a huge part of our culture, and, um, you know, I think there's even, like, a, you know, because epigenetics, for one, says that, you know, we're transferring information from our brains uh, through, you know, the, the, the saline, the proteins that uh, go through our brains when we uh, have kids, and so that's why, you know, there are cultural ideas and habits that are passed down uh, through, you know, hereditary, um, uh, lineages, you know, family lineages, uh, so, you know, it's, a, uh, it's not just genetics that are passed on, um, but, uh, you know, I, I actually, you know, that's part of my psychology paper, which I, you know, tried to make a video on reading, but my camera died, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, actually, there's a lot of proof for that being the case, um, but anyways, um, I don't want to make this video too long, uh, but, uh, yeah, so, um, the, uh, this bestial abomination, um, the, the fallen angel of divine origin naturally is in league with the aliens, that's another heavily implied idea, is that the aliens are in fact what the world has in the past construed to be demons or jinn, you know, uh, they are tracked down by angels in a, while masquerading as people in the daylight, whereupon they will rapidly shift into what looks like a massive bison on two legs with metal claws and a metal mask, almond black eyes, and dark yellow teeth. Following such a confrontation, there will be a showdown between the two and the fallen angel lineage. Catastrophe erupts as entire contents. Sorry, continents, um, 
uh, can be pulled into the implosion that devastates the planet as the human angel's power is consumed by the fallen angel. So the fallen angel, when it consumes that power, will grow. Um, the fallen angel will then proceed to root itself in the area. So, you know, it's putting these, like, these rusty cable-like roots into the ground like trees. Uh, or like a giant fucking tree that grows out into this big, metallic, cloudy, electric, bloody storm. Picture that, if you will. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, they, they then start to transmit telepathic viruses that infect people around the world with an underlying devotion to worship and perform for these new overlords. So kind of like the stand, you know, there's a good good versus evil thing here, but I make it a little more ambiguous, um, but we'll get to that. So, such an event leads the aliens to form a pact with this fallen angel and subsequently declare war against the rest of the world, um, because, you know, they have, they have very similar motivations. But I haven't gotten into really what the aliens' motivations are yet, but we're in. Um, and human angels require, and this is one of my favorite parts because it's just, it's ironic and it's kind of a, a jab at, um, you know, pro-lifers, um, but they require, like, just constant, uh, stem cell and steroid shots to continue to maintain their mortal form so they don't go fucking nuclear and blow up into a big alien and there's like angel, big, big angel unleashed fucking fire and fury and this massive energy outburst killing everything around them because they're trying to work with people. If they reach an unstable state, they would become at risk of violently transforming into their seraphim, seraphim form before the, their holy fire burns its wick to the end or upon a blast of unfathomable proportion will ultimately erupt and ravage the world to unfathomable ends. The aliens' predominant game plan, and so here, as I said, I'm getting into their motivations, uh, is to expunge the Earth of all current occupants and to repopulate it with alien-human hybrids. So yeah, you know, some of this is taken from real conspiracy theories because, you know, I've, I, I just, I, I, for just creative inspiration, I, I like conspiracy theories, um, but I treat them kind of as sub what I deem subconscious fiction, but, you know, that's a whole other concept that would take me a long time to explain, but, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory from the title. Anyways, so these alien-human hybrids have similar qualities to the more, more mortally bound angels as they require stem cells as sustenance, and then, so this kind of creates a war um, between stem cells, um, uh, or, well, between the, the angels, humans, the aliens, and the fallen angel, um, the hybrids, to you know, get their hands on stem cells. Um, and as you probably know, if you know anything about war, it's resources that drive most war and attacks. Like, you know, uh, Pearl Harbor, for example happened because um, Rockefeller and Churchill cut off the Japanese supply to oil and uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, which, you know, I, I think is totally warranted because, you know, you may have heard of the rape of Nanking. If not, it is one of the most atrocious things um, I've ever read, and it was a result of uh, the Japanese going, hey, fucking Manchuria is ours now because we're imperial and we are the superior race and we deserve this, that, and the other. Like they said something like Manifest Destiny is for pussies or whatever, or we're gonna make Manifest Destiny look like it's for cowards, like something along those lines. So, yeah, no, Imperial Japan is pretty fucking bad in that regard. Um, but, uh, yeah, so. Uh, my, my point being that, you know, I was, uh, there is an aspect of, oh, this is, this is what wars are about, you know, it's, it's not about the fact that, oh, suddenly aliens and angels have been revealed to the planet, no, no, it's about who's getting the resources that are 
driving the car between both forces. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, so a bloody war blitzes the globe as the fallen angel alien axis sink their prongs into the scalp of the earth and uproot much of it in the process of human pushback offensive helmed by mortal seraphim is waged and um, after heavy casualties on both sides that ends in stalemate a treaty is drafted that entails above all the integration of alien human hybrids into regular society something much of the world would begrudgingly accept knowing that humans are on the brink of a great downfall so you know everyone's kind of experiencing this new form of existential dread and that not just we're gonna die but our whole fucking species is pretty much on the verge of death and yeah yeah you say that the news and fear mongering is telling us that every day but you know there's a difference between seeing it on the news or hearing it on the news and then fucking seeing it all around you um but uh on we go uh, this means to an end ultimately proves fateful uh, as civil war between two hominid species quickly bulldozes its way for all remaining communities. Moreover, lack of immunity for the alien human hybrids leads to a new plague that permutes into something transmissible to humans. So now the human hy hybrid, alien hybrids and the humans are experiencing a new plague. So, you know, I just. Again, I'm not religious, but I have read the Bible, and you know, lots of this is inspired by Revelations, which is, now in my opinion, a pretty fucked up part of the Bible. It's pretty nutty. It's one of the nuttier parts of the Bible, but I mean, um, it's not completely dissimilar from what I'm describing here. And so, uh, fatality is almost certain if this contagion is ingested. It's at this point that the alien fallen... Uh, Angel Axis manages to manufacture a toxin that can infect angels of sin and acts on them like syphilis acts on us. So it slowly starts to corrupt them like syphilis um, back when it was not treatable uh, would rot people's brains. You know, like even like, like, like 500 years ago, like people's faces would be like falling off and shit if they had syphilis. Um, so, you know, it's, it's doing that to the angels, essentially. It's, it's, it's degrading them, and, you know, mentally, in terms of how they can function awareness-wise, in terms of the intention behind their will, but also, physically, they start to erode. Um, and so, uh, yeah, as they lose cognitive function, and their power deteriorates and neurosis um, envelops them. They go mad and are filled with an unquenchable thirst for power. So it's like the fallen angel starts influencing them through this temptation. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, since they can only find power otherwise through, you know, being charged by God's throne or this, you know, the souls of human beings, they'll all end up going fucking rogue and trying to snack on people to maintain their form. Um, but eat as they may, they uh, only feed the infection by ingesting the sins of their hosts as well. So, you know, it ends up being kind of a double edged sword. Um, and this metastasis finally concludes when the angel's energy depletes to the point where it just poofs out of existence. Um, all that energy gone. Uh, many of these heavily weakened angels meet their end at the hands of human headhunters, paid by the Axis, who hunt and trap and behead ailing angels. Sin bombs. Yes, and you know, this may sound silly, but there is actually an attempt I believe it was South African government to make gay bombs. So, trust me, in terms of ludicrous, reality is definitely stranger than fiction. Um, but, so, you know, sin bombs being this contagion 
you know, mixed with the sin of captured human hosts by the Axis, um, are just dumped on major cities that are working in league with the angels who aren't fully corrupted. And this causes humans to engage in lascivious, greedy, and highly dangerous activities as any moral uh, constitution they have just rots away. Dust bowls blanket much of the world and the ozone layer is so marred with holes that it resembles Swiss cubes. I mean, we're already halfway there, but evidently, you know, there's aliens combusting, or sorry, angels combusting. Causing these like nuclear fucking style explosions. The Axis has these massive parts of the globe captured with factories fucking just draining people of sin and fucking putting out disease and dust pools. You know, it's gonna make the it's gonna make a uh, whole greenhouse gas effect a lot fucking worse. Um, but uh, yeah, so. Um, Space travel becomes impossible from all the debris that ends up going into orbit, trapping us on the planet. And that, to me, is one of the scariest things. The fact that we can, like, because, you know, if any debris, like, say a satellite gets hit by a bolt that's going 10,000 miles an hour in polar orbit, um, it'll shatter into, you know, 100,000 bolt-sized pieces, and then it, in that same orbit will be, like, bullets just fucking... You know, like, like the International Space Station gets hit all the time by just little pieces of debris and it completely tears them apart and you know that is a very real fate for us. Elon Musk, are you listening? Elon Musk, the guy who put three satellites behind each other which is kind of a recipe for them to collide I would imagine. I mean I see the Starlink satellite all the time, it's kind of cool to look at but it's like oh well fuck do we really need more satellites at this point? Because that's how we're going to trap ourselves in the planet. It's a very real prospect. Why well, I included that. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, some of the people who are largely defined by their sins deliberately seek out the contagion and take it like a drug as it gives them an increased adrenaline surge when they engage in their preferred immoral activity. Uh, the remaining seraphim in desperation transmit their holy signals to mostly, I'm, this, this is not being insensitive, um, I am nearly autistic myself, I was actually diagnosed with autism for a while, but they transmit their signals to mostly autistic or mentally ill people, um, because, you know, there's some people who, with mental illness or, uh, autism, you know, if it's severe enough, who maintain a sort of childlike innocence, so, you know, I, I, I believe, you know, as much as I hate being around children, that they have an innocence that, you know, we lose when we grow up. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they, and since, you know, children are being kind of, just, like, just leached on for their, uh, uh, stem cells in this, you know, there's not many children left at this point. Um, so, uh, yeah, they reach out to, you know, sort of childlike, um, autistic, mentally ill people, which causes a revolutionary resurgence for humanity as a scattered array of, uh, cells comprised of ordinary people who moonlight as operatives for the angels launch numerous offenses against the Axis, which are mostly like, you know, these are, these are suicide missions, basically. They're going in to just sabotage, and, you know, there's very little likelihood they're going to make it out. Because, as I said at this point, the fallen angel has rooted itself in, essentially, the European continent, and it is growing out in these entire areas. Are right now these, like, wastelands just populated by factories and made to, you know, squeeze the ever-living life out of humans and to experiment on them and whatnot, like, you know, the Nazis and the Japanese did in World War II. And a lot of this inspired by World War II and big World War II buff. Um, or World War I and World War II, all wars. I, you know, I'm not because I'm pro-war, but because I'm fascinated just by 
uh, why these things happen and I think it's important to know about these things so we can look for signs of stuff that will lead up to similar events because you know they were you know I, I think World War One should have never happened uh, World War Two obviously shouldn't have, shouldn't have happened that was horrible um, and uh, you know I obviously the Axis were, were the bad guys but the Allies, you know, did some pretty fucked up shit themselves, um, and, you know, like, like, Nuremberg, had Nuremberg trial, this kangaroo court, like, here's all the bad fucking Nazi Japanese dudes who, yeah, you know, fucking, they should die, they should die, they were fucking, they were perpetrating genocide, but they were making this big, and this where the problem for me lies, this big, highly publicized event of, we're gonna try these people on, um, you know, they all hung, no one, no one walked free, no one got a lighter sentence, um, but in the back door, we're gonna take all the, like, Nazis and the imperialists who may have some data that would benefit us, and we're gonna put them to work. So, Operation Paperclip happened at the same time. Coincidence? I think no. I don't think it's a conspiracy to say that. Um, could always be wrong though. You never know. Anyways, um, so, uh, yeah, because of these, um, sort of guerrilla offenses on behalf of, uh, the humans and the seraphim, um, a retaliatory attack from the Axis is provoked. And this is characterized by them rendering many city, cities across the globe into salt, kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, you know, much like a nuclear explosion would do, or similar. I mean, a nuclear explosion would render you into carbon, basically, but um, similar. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, you know, again, uh, World War II. Uh, you know, everyone talks about how bad uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was. Yes, terrible many innocent people died, um, but firebombings were way more deadly, and, you know, if there's ever a justified use of nuclear weapons, it's there because that was what caused Japan to finally throw in the towel, and, um, you know, it was an unfortunate show of force, but the firebombing of Tokyo killed, I think, more than Nagasaki and Hiroshima combined. I could be wrong about that, but I do know the firebombing of Dresden, which again, innocent people dying um, because the British targeted the city. Um, you know, it, it killed more, definitely more people than both both uh, those nuclear. You know, fat boy and uh, was little or something for the other one. Um, he dropped on Nagasaki here. You know, killed more than both of the cities combined, um, for sure. Um, feel free, free to fact check me on that, and if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. But I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong about that. Um, anyways, so um, yeah, they're they're the axis is just fucking annihilating cities here. And so this rebuttal will uh, prove to sour all remaining human populations to their presence and a rush to infiltrate the fallen angels fortress takes place as people are just like, you know, there's nothing we can do but work as a collective now against this insanely oppressive force. Um, it's like Reagan said, you know, it would take an alien invasion to unite the world. Like, he actually said that. Um, but many waves are cut down, uh, so, you know, waves of humans trying to infiltrate um, foreign angels' territory. They're just cut down and captured and modified into these automatons that fight for the Axis. And the fallen one uses its human fuel to seize the Atlantic Ocean as its limbs penetrate the ground and clogs, or sorry, clog the ocean up with thorny metal tentacles. Um, in the final bid, the Seraphim Oh yeah, and they also, they're like, these the, the limbs are releasing toxins into the ocean and corroding it, um, but, uh, yeah, so, um, in a final bid, the seraphim left alive, assailed the fallen angel in unison, they all just fucking descend on the fallen angel and manage to rip it from the earth before hurtling it into the Kupier Belt, for those who don't know. Kupier Belt is a bunch of comets that are outside our solar system, 
and um, you know that's why we we have comets that will stray out of the Kuiper Belt and go through our solar system. With their, and I think most of them get sucked into um, the the gravitational pull of Saturn, but there are also um, some that uh, you know, like Hailbach comet, go right by us. Um, there's actually also planets in the Kuiper Belt too, but they're not considered planets of our solar system because Kuiper Belt, right? Anyways, um, I also think they're considered dwarf planets like Pluto. Um, uh, so in a final bid, the Seraphim left to sail the fallen angel in unison, managed to rip it from the earth before hurling it into the Kuiper Belt with themselves as they all reach critical mass, no more stem cells to fucking slurp up and sustain themselves, and explode, annihilating both themselves and the fallen angel. So, all the alien, or sorry, all the angels die. The bad angel and the you know, relatively good angels all die in this massive self-sacrifice. Um, so, the rest of the aliens are just lynched by the remaining human population, which is, like, drastically reduced by this point, um, and so they decide to make peace with the hybrids, because the hybrids didn't really have any choice in being made into alien-human hybrids, and with the blast of light uh, from the self-destructed seraphim, all the debris in the atmosphere is vaporized, every planet and the satellite in the solar system, and by satellite I mean moons, um, so natural satellites, um, and, uh, you know, planets like Earth, uh, are revitalized, um, from this energy released by the detonation of the seraphim, and the surviving occupants of Earth start to spread throughout the cosmos, finding the evidence of extraplanetary mythologies 